Hello again, people. Uh, Zach here again today. And uh, I think that today I'm going to be talking about warp technology. Um, in particular, two different approaches that I've come up with myself um, that deviate from the way that it it's tends to be approached by the mainstream. Um, so just to understand, um, so we're clear on what warp technology is, um, there's a particular axiom or, or postulate that um, nothing can move faster than the speed of light. Now, um, first of all, this technically isn't true. Um, I mean, the speed of light differs from medium to medium, but um, the there are conditions in which certain things move faster than the speed of light, but just not faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. Um, say, for example, there's there's a there's a particular type of phenomenon called Cherenkov radiation, which is where like electrons move faster than the speed of light through the water, and it causes the water to glow. Um, it like radiates like a, a deep blue color, um, and but even then, like within the vacuum of space, there's technically speaking, there's not a consistent, um, there's not a consistent speed through the vacuum of space either. Um, if you if you think about the way that general relativity works, because what we say is that light is bent by gravitational um, fields, whether you think it's space-time or um, being or whatever, and actually I, I'm a little skeptical of that myself. I would have to want to work it out, but even if we know that light is bent um, through gravitational fields, um, what that implies is that the speed of light actually changes depending on the gravitational potential, which varies all throughout space. So to say that um, something is faster than the light uh, speed of light in a vacuum, um, what you're leaving out here is a particular parameter that says uh, what the gravitational potential is at that point, which actually varies over space. But um, anyway, um, so the even if we said that the speed of light is um, a limit and that nothing can surpass the speed of light, so now what we have to do is we have to break the laws of physics in order to figure out how we can move faster than the speed of light. And the way that this is approached is to uh, by the warp drive is through warping space and time. Um, what you're trying to do is you're trying to create an expanding space behind your vehicle um, while you're contracting the space in front of the vehicle, which causes the objects to move forward without actually um, using propulsion. Um, now, the most obvious problem with this is that space and time are not things and you can't warp space time. Um, the, the second obvious problem with this is that you require negative energy in order to accomplish this, and negative energy is impossible. So the whole idea just like you have to throw it in the trash right then and there. Um, but there was something that I had mentioned in um, one of my prior videos, I think it was the one on being on time, about the um, how everything has a certain realm of things of, that it's conscious of. Um, its own kind of specific reality. And one of the examples that I had used in this was uh, had to do with standing waves. And, and I like to call this harmonic separation. If you're, if you're familiar with standing waves, um, say if you example you had a string that was tethered to two points, the way that a standing wave works is that there's like an oscillation that goes through and the, the waves, um, their location within this um, within this band stays in the same location. So if there's anything that's resting inside of one of these curves, it's completely isolated from everything on the other sides and they can't interact. So what you have is like you can have multiple layers of reality that are stacked on top of each other and nothing um, is able to perceive the one that's, that's next to it. And um, one of the ideas that I used to kind of support this um, was the um, the observation of uh, dark energy and dark matter. I mean, which again is some, something questionable, but um, it's just to show that the idea is not entirely radical. Um, but there was another thing that I mentioned as well, which is that um, time is, is nothing. Um, it's actually a measurement of the difference between two things that are becoming um, and the rate at which they do so. And so there's this question um, about whether or not it's possible to distort the rate of becoming through constructive and destructive interference with the rate of quantized energy exchange. And, and what I mean by this is like, if you've ever seen, um, well, if you ever take like a, like a pendulum, right? And um, if you were to just slap the, the pendulum at a, at a rapid rate, at the same rate all over and over time, the, the pendulum is not gonna go anywhere. If anything, you just kind of shock all of the energy out of it. And so it just, it, it hovers around the one point. But if you hit it with the right timing and like you keep you 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 hit it the right with the right rhythm, like you're not hitting it at a constant rhythm, you're increasing it relative to um, how it how it bounces back. Um, 
what you can do is you can keep increasing that energy. Just keep increasing it and increasing it. And this is an idea that's known as resonance. Um, so the the idea that I'm getting at here is that what happens if you can use this um, interference in order to shift um, the the rate of becoming for a particular object? Um, the effect that you get is that you're actually shifting the reference frame without moving in space. Um, so it's kind of like it's equivalent to bringing things closer together in time or distancing them from, uh, apart from each other in time. And the consequence of doing this, um, of decreasing time through this resonance or synchronization, is that you actually increase the acceleration because acceleration is distance over time squared. So th this is just the general, um, the first method that I uh, had come up with for how to um, create a warp drive. And, and, and the interesting thing about this one particular method as well is that there, there's different um, technologies that can come out of this. Um, take, for example, um, artificial gravity, uh, stargates, teleportation, um, because all of this stuff uh, is fundamentally just throwing reference frames around. Um, so the, the second you're able to achieve that, all of this other stuff just comes along for the ride. Um, so the... The second method that I had come up with um, is based on a non-Newtonian model of physics. And to begin with this and, and why um, I use different axioms, we can, we can start with the first one, uh, axiom of Newton's laws of motion, um, because it's actually the most problematic. Um, we say that an object in motion... Um, conserves its motion unless it's acted upon by an external force, or if it's at rest, it stays at rest um, unless acted upon by an external force. Um, the first things first is that there's no such thing as rest. Every Everything in the entire universe is vibrating and or moving. Um, there is nothing in the universe that stands still no matter what frame of reference that you're looking at. And this also means that there's technically no such thing as an inertial frame of reference. It, it's purely conceptual. Um, you can define a particular point in space to be an inertial frame of reference, but in reality, such things don't exist. Um, the other issue, which is even bigger, is that um, things do not uh, conserve their motion unless acted upon by an external force. Um, as, as a matter of fact, everything in the universe is accelerating either towards or away from something else. Um, that we... The most obvious one would be like gravitation, but there's also like the idea of electromagnetic, um, electromagnetic uh, gravitation or repulsion, and uh, and and of course, like if we if we're thinking about um, if we're trying to do the mathematics on this, it helps us to kind of conceptualize such things as forces, but they're not really forces because they're not weights. Something that's in free fall um, in a vacuum is not actually experiencing any form. It's entirely weightless. Um, and I think this is actually the basis of um, one of Einstein's earlier theories of relativity, um, where he actually does mention that the, the speed of light is dependent upon the gravitational potential, which varies throughout space. But anyway... Um, the uh, so if we know that gra acceleration is not force, like an object falling to the ground is acceleration, not force. Um, we also know that acceleration is not caused by force; and that it's caused by like an energy field. So which just means like the the time. I mean, the space derivative of an energy field is actually acceleration, not force. Um, but anyway. Um, the way that I look at it is that force only exists where there's contact between two bodies. Um, and it actually is in the opposite direction of the acceleration. If you're falling downward, the, the force that you feel is actually an upward force. It's one, and it only exists when you're making contact with like, um, like air drag, like air resistance, or if you're making contact with the ground, then you have an upward force that like counter, uh, counteracts that acceleration. Um, but the for the acceleration itself is not due to a force, and so this is actually um, in conflict with the the second law. Uh, I mean, second axiom of Newton's laws of motion, which is the uh, the idea that the force is in the same direction as the acceleration, or I mean, or the momentum. But anyway, um, so just to establish like where this comes from, the idea that acceleration and force are in opposite directions. Um, now, the other thing that we we do know. Um, anyone who study this is that acceleration and force are the time derivatives of velocity and momentum. Um, 
Now, momentum is actually just the same thing as inertia. I mean, in essentially speaking, um, you're talking about a resistance to changes in the current state of something. And so what this means is that if you have um, a, um, a relationship like how uh, P equals MV for mass, uh, momentum equals mass times velocity, um, this means that um, inertia is equal to mass times velocity. And what this also means is that mass is equal to inertia over velocity. And the consequence of this is that inertia over velocity is equal to force over acceleration. Um, and if you cross multiply these um, these two things, what you find is um, that the product of inertia and acceleration is equal to the product of force and velocity, um, which kind of suggests that inertia, even though we, we know that inertia is the opposite of acceleration, it suggests that force is the opposite of velocity. Um, uh, kind of a shout out here um, after I noticed this relationship to um, Ken Wheeler uh, who's made many videos in the past on magnetism and he, he talks a lot about the relationship between um, force and motion and inertia and acceleration. Um, now uh, I don't get a lot of his stuff but I do watch it because I think that there's something to what he's saying but I, I don't quite grasp it all. But anyway um, so knowing that these things are opposites, we know that inertia is in the opposite direction of the acceleration and uh, that force is in the opposite direction of velocity. So if I'm moving this way, the force that I'm going to um, have when I come in contact with something is actually going to be in the direction that's opposite of the direction that I'm moving. Um, and the another interesting thing about a relationship that comes out of this is that we know that um, from new from the classical Newtonian mechanics that power is um, the product of force and velocity. Well, if you do the math here, after you figure out what, you know, that force um, is equivalent to inertia over time, um, it turns out to be the case that power is actually equivalent to the product of inertia and acceleration. Um, it's just um, an interesting thing to look at. Um, another interesting relationship as well is that the, the work is... Um, is equivalent to the product of the inertia and the velocity. Um, and you can actually derive this by taking the relationship W equals PT equals um, IAT equals IV, um, or also by the relationship W equals FD because F is equal to I over T, so you just end up getting ID over T, which is IV. But anyway, um, power is, is the release of energy. Now, where we really start getting into where the technology comes in is, is right here. Now, as I, as I mentioned before, the, the gradient of an energy field or its derivative with respect to space is an acceleration field. It's, it's not a time, um, it's not a force field. Um, and one of the things you have to, the, have to ask yourself is if it's possible to redirect the energy flow. Um, and I, I think the answer to this question is yes, um, because it actually does happen already um, with, with gyroscopes. Um, when, when you think of the way that the, the gravitational force is exerted on uh, any object, like if you, like the ideally speaking, if you were just looking at a small unit of space, the gravity is just a downward force, like straight down. And so um, if you have an object that's like balancing on a point, even the very, very slightest um, offset in, in its weight is going to cause it to collapse. Um, now, if we also consider the absence of gravity, and we think that the uh, if you think of the gyroscope from like a top-down view, like if we were looking at the force um, as the as the top was as as it's spinning um, outside of gravity, what you would see is um, a spiral that's that's formed by the way that the the object accelerates, and so if you were to combine these two different ideas of this downward um, of this downward uh, force or this, I mean, this downward acceleration with like this outward, like tangent acceleration. Um, what you get is like this vortex that almost looks like a hyperboloid, um, where all of the, the force is concentrated here, but it spreads out. Like all of the, all of that energy just like spreads out into a larger plane. And so now it kind of makes sense why, um, a gyroscope wouldn't fall over. It's because all of that energy, instead of being concentrated and trying to balance on that one particular point, it's now dispersed over a large area. And so what this means is that the, um, the precession of the gyroscope actually has more control over its motion than the, uh, than the gravitation does. Um, now, where, where are we going from here? Well, what, what happens if, if it can be, dis if it can be redirected downwards like that? Um, 
could you not redirect the force back upwards, um, completing the geometry? Um, if you've ever, ever um, heard of something uh, it's called a Toro flux, it's like the uh, it's like a torus where they take. Um, it's kind of like a torus that's uh, formed by a spirograph. If you, if you were to collapse it, what you got is a ring, but it, it, if you like pop it in your hands, it pops up at the full volume, and there's like a spiral where things like collapse inwards, but then they spread back outwards um, and back up to the top. And so my, my idea is like, what if you can do the same thing, this completion of the shape, where you got the gyration that's coming down, but then you redirect the force back upwards, um, probably through something like a waveguide. Um, if you can redirect that energy flow upwards, and then you can also ex like in like boost that energy uh, that energy flow, you should actually be able to achieve um, artificial gravity. I mean, not by redirecting the gravity that's already there. Um, and and so that's just a, the secondary approach um, to what I was thinking of. It's like you're converting a downward force into an upward force. Um, now there, there's a third um, model um, for trying to um, well backing up a bit to try to get back onto the warp drive idea. Um, if if we can redirect and control the direction of gravity, um, and we know that the gravitational potential um, is correlated to becoming then that means that by shifting the gravitational potential, we're also controlling time to a certain extent. And so that's, that's where that idea connects in. That's why I'm calling it a warp drive, is because the, these two things are intimately intertwined. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I had a third idea as well for how to approach this problem. Um, and, and, and it's related more to... Um, It's another type of, of, of field mechanics, and, and and really, when you get down to it, any type of warp drive is going to be based off of field mechanics. But this this other idea was based off of a, a really old idea I had, um, based on like velocity fields and um, something that I I think I called temporal flux or something like that. But anyway, um, it, it would take me a while to kind of remember what that one was about exactly. Um, but and. Anyway, I think I'm just going to go ahead and, and cut it off around here because this, this video is kind of getting a little bit long, and um, I just kind of wanted to dump these ideas out there so people um, could hear them. Because um, I mean, I don't I don't care who invents the technology. I just I think it's cool. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Um, see you again next time.